In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Leaf Tulin and I, we are going to share our thoughts on the top center prospects in the 2024 NBA Draft. There's a wide range of opinions on each big. Some people don't think it is worth taking a big in the lottery or even in the middle of the first round. So we're going to find out Leaf's thoughts on this, this big man class and find out who he believes is the best center in the 2024 NBA draft. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. We are your daily source for NBA draft content. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And I think we have a good team with a each person brings something different to the table. Leaf watches more college basketball than anyone else. Richard does a good job. He's been on for a while. Then my brother James offers his his opinion which is a little bit different so if you love the nba draft and you love hearing a wide range of opinions on prospects we got you covered right here and before we get into this episode i want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by jace medical empower yourself when you purchase a jace case it provides you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections so get yours today at jacemedical.com and use the code locked on L O C K E D O N to get $20 off your first order. That is Jace Medical, J A S E Medical.com. All right, Leaf, how's it going? College basketball season is here. It's in full swing. Conference play has started. We're only like, really, like two months away from March Madness. What has been your, your overall thoughts on this college basketball season so far? It's pretty wide open. And yeah, I, I was checking some bracketology this morning. So that, that shows how into it I am. I uh, I can never stay away from a bracket, even if I know or if I feel pretty confidently at one team's not even going to be close to that seating range. I still look at it and think, oh, man, I'll be able to see this team and already got my madness ticket secured and excited for it. And I think this year is really wide open from a college basketball standpoint, but also the draft. I think there's varying ranges of opinion, whereas last year there was a pretty clear cut hierarchy, whether you ordered it the same, th that wasn't necessarily the case, but there was always a hierarchy of who's who. And then there is a few sleepers this year. I think everyone's who's who is different and that's not typical for an NBA draft. Yeah, I, I agree. It's so many different opinions on prospects that are, i mean it is it's just wide open from the people that i've spoken to there's really not a, a consensus in a sense there's some guys that you know like draft boards may have as a top 10 pick that some scouts or executives think are mid lottery and, and vice versa like i said it last year but i think it, it's really true this year 15 through 40 not much of a difference between those guys. It's just going to be an acquired taste. And I think a lot of it is just going to really come down to Intel, like whose Intel is better. What team feels better about bringing this prospect into their environment. So I don't know if talent is going to be the, the main thing that separates, you know, player a from player B, but in this episode, we're going to talk about the bigs. There's quite a few bigs in this class. Very different players. You, know, you got your old school, traditional big and Zach Eady. You have your, your modern day bigs that space the floor. So in your opinion, who is the best five? And I'm not talking about guys that are probably can play four and five, but just strictly five. Who is your top five in this NBA draft? I think this is going to come at a come as a shock. And I think throughout the rest of the season, this guy's stock will grow. I'm going to go with Aaron Bradshaw of Kentucky. I think he has the best complementary skills of athleticism and coordination. Uh, there are guys I think are probably slightly more coordinated, and there are guys that are pretty athletic, but neither have the same like ability to grow in each department. Bradshaw is a tremendous athlete. He steps out and shoots the ball already. I feel like his hands are good defensively. He's learning 
the Kentucky system is what I would say is what he's doing because it's skill wise. I think he's got the timing, the re- reflexes, the reaction time to become an impactful shot blocker. And he's pretty impactful in passing lanes already. Uh, there's strength he can put on. And I think he got off to a delayed start because of his injury. And this is a guy that came in with lottery expectations and now on a lot of draft boards is in the second round. And he's just being punished for lack of production in terms of numbers. But if you watch Kentucky play, since they've gotten him back, they have a backbone to their defense and their guards play better uh, on the perimeter defensively because they trust they have an anchor. And offensively, he's steadily making more and more of an impact, both as a pop guy and a roll guy. Uh, I know this may not be the popular pick, but I but I think he's got the most upside, and I think he's the most traditional. Uh, he's a mix of the, like he's not the most traditional. He's the mix of the of a traditional big and the most upside of a modern big, other than Alex Sar. Yeah, I think he has upside to be your vertical lob threat, defensive anchor, and floor spacer. I do think he's a little bit delayed because he missed so much time with a foot injury. I mean, you're talking about someone that missed, I mean, he missed the summer, he missed fall camp, and then you're kind of throwing him in right before conference play. So he is a little rusty. I do think that he could have a a, a Derek Lively type impact in the second half of the year and then shoot up into the lottery. So I like I like Aaron Bradshaw a lot. Who is the next center on, on your list? I think I'm going with Donovan Klingon, but I have reservations. Uh, Kyle Filipowski, I just want to clarify this. Kyle Filipowski, to me, is a four. Um, I don't think he plays the five at the NBA level. Space is the floor well. So I, I would put I would put Klingon probably still ahead of Filipowski, but he's he hasn't wowed me. Last year, his efficiency was through the roof, and you were talking about how he could be a one-and-done type pick and, and follow the footsteps of Walker Kessler because he's a shot blocker, he's coordinated, and his per-minute stats were absolutely phenomenal. Well, this year he's taking on the full responsibility as opposed to Adama Sanogo, you know, taking on the brunt of some of the attention of the defenses, and he would dominate in spurts. This year he's been good. His efficiency is very good still. Uh, Per 36 minutes, he was a 24-point score, or excuse me, yeah, per 36, he was 24 a game, and and 11 boards per game with three and a half blocks. Those are really good numbers. But I've watched a ton of UConn, and he looks a little less athletic, and I wonder if those foot injuries, one in the preseason, one that popped back up, and then one that sidelined him again, uh, have, have hampered that ability. And I know that's not, an un- that's not a fair thing to be like, oh, well, evaluate uh, the injury. But but I'm evaluating what I've seen from basketball thing. He doesn't look as ex- explosive. He doesn't look as fluid as a scorer when playing against starters. So I'm a little lower than I was entering this season. But I still think he would be my second collegiate center ranked uh, behind Aaron Bradshaw. And then Filipowski, I, I know a lot of people will be questioning this. I, I think of him more in the mold of Kelly Olenek, as a f- who's a power forward, in my opinion, than I do a floor spacing center. Uh, I know he's playing center at Duke, but they're horrific defensively around the rim. Like lineups with and without Filipowski around the rim are allowing about 70% finishing rates. And that's really, really bad, especially for college basketball. Um, So I I think he's a skilled player, but you don't want him to be a rim protector. I agree. All right. I I have a lot more to add on that. All right. When we return, I want to talk a little bit more about Donovan Klingin and Kyle Filipowski. Me and my brother just did a, a podcast where I mentioned Filipowski was, was one of my hardest evals. But before we get into that, I want to talk to you about something a little serious. I want to talk to you about Jace Medical. Now, I know we come to sports and I know people listen to podcasts like this to escape from some of the realities of life. But let's talk about real life, because according to the FDA, Pharmacies are running out of antibiotics right now, right now in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, which is actually pretty scary. And what's scary to me is the the feeling of being hopeless, whether it's me or my wife or my son or, or anyone having not having access to the medication they need because of, of a supply chain issue. With Jace Medical, that is not something that you have to worry about because Jace Medical has what they call a Jace case, which is a pack of five different antibiotics that treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, 
skin infections, among other things. All of this stuff could happen to us. But if you go to jacemedical.com, you can complete your profile with a physician and it will be reviewed by a board certified physician and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at the fraction of the regular costs. It has never been more important to be prepared than today. So go to jacemedical.com, use the offer code locked on, L O C K E D O N. You can get $20 off your first order. That is Jace Medical, J A S E Medical.com. If you are an everyday or that you know all about Locked On Sports today, but if you're not familiar, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts from the Locked On Network, plus the national shows that cover every league. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 hours a day, seven days a week streaming channel. All right, when we left off, we were talking about Donovan Klingen and Kyle Filipowski. I'll start off with Klingen. I agree with everything you said. He's actually been a little underwhelming to me. I think it has 100% to do with the foot injuries. I don't think he's in as great a shape as he was in last year. The athleticism as far as just like how quick he gets off the ground, the way he's moving, it just doesn't look the same as it did last year. And I think it's all related to the foot injuries. But that is what's giving me some reservation about his draft stock right now because he's 7'3". I've seen him listed at 280 or 285 which is, I think, 20 pounds more than last year. I saw him listed at like 260 last year. But when you have someone that is 7'2", 280 pounds, he's had multiple foot injuries, It's I think it can make his draft stock a little tricky. Are you concerned about the foot injuries and his size, considering the history of, of bigs with foot injuries? Yes, but but what concerns me the most is that it, there was the obvious impact. Like you and I hadn't spoken about this at all, but we both picked up on he looks considerably slower. Like one of the things that was so alluring about Kling is he ran like a deer last year. And, and yes, I, I talked about how he probably had more energy playing sparingly, but he just doesn't jump the same. Like I watched him play against Kansas and they threw a few alley-oops over the top to him and he wouldn't get above the rim. And he, he's seven foot three. You got to catch those oops and slam them. And that's what he was so good at last year. And he would impact shots because he'd reach heights that very few could reach. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm concerned. The reason I still have him two of my center rankings, though, is that if he comes back right and his efficiency is this good already, and I've seen what he can do, uh, that I believe that there's an impact for him. And I see the role. Like you outlined a comparison in Walker Kessler last year, and I see Walker Kessler play every day. And he impacts the game with his length and reaction time. Like Utah's played a, a box in one zone and they can only run it when Kessler's there because he deters everything at the rim. So they can put a lot of pressure. I think uh, Kling could have that type of impact, especially with his ability to run, but I think he needs to lose weight. And I think the foot has to be very well checked out. So yes, I do have some pause, but I'm on basketball alone. Uh, that's where I'd value him. What's your take on Filipowski? Now, to me, he is a tough eval, and I talked about it in, in detail in the last pod. And he's a tough eval for me because I don't think he is what I like in a center. When I picture an NBA center, I want him to either be a vertical lob threat, a floor spacer, or a defensive anchor. And if he's not... Those three, then I need him to be a beast on the block, someone where I can give him the ball in the post and feel like he can get me a bucket at any given time. There's only a few of those guys. I think Shingun is in that category, Joel Embiid, and obviously Nikola Jokic. I think there's a few other guys. So They got more or, touches. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's the – it's the same thought process that goes through my mind. And that's why I think he's like a utility four, like not someone that you want to be your modern wing, but someone on the right team that spaces the floor, plays intelligent basketball and has the size to be able to impact the game. And what I mean by that is he's not necessarily going to be a shot blocker at the NBA level, even though he's doing a pretty good job, nearly two blocks a game. Um, 
he and by but I mean pretty good job in terms of statistics. There he's terrible at protecting the rim in terms of watching Duke. Uh, but with that size, you can collect rebounds. You can um, alter passing lanes. Like the NBA is trending to a little more zone re, uh, and size is just a benefit. And uh, you watch him shoot. He's shooting 37%. That was the question. It was like, everyone feels like he can shoot because he shot a lot last year, but he didn't shoot well. But he's shooting 70, 37% from three. He's scoring efficiently. Defensively, I just don't like it. I, I'm a I'm a big believer in uh, an anchor. And a defensive anchor is my center. Unless you have tremendous, tremendous ball pressuring guards, I, I just don't like not having an a anchor. And offensively, I think a lot of the appeal for Filipowski is having the ball in his hands and some of the skill that comes with that. What offense is going to give him the ball in the NBA to have the same role that he's thriving in at Duke? So I'm, I'd am i consider myself more of a skeptic. Last year, I didn't have him in the first round. Uh, this year, I think he would be in my first round just because I think the strength of the draft is is lesser than last year, but I'm still a bit of a skeptic. Yeah, before the pit game, I think he was around 28 or 29% from three, maybe 31 at the highest. He goes four for four, and that bumps him up to 37% from three. And so I was talking to about my brother. We had about 40-plus games sample size of him hovering around 28 to 31% from three. And so now if you – say I question him as a floor spacer. And if someone just goes and looks at the stats today, they'll say, you, you look crazy. But I'm I'm glad that there's someone else that has some of the same reservations. Do you have a, a player comparison? Because I keep hearing, well, I guess you said Olenek. I've heard yeah. Mo Wagner. Um, but, I mean, if, if he's Mo Wagner or Kelly Olenek, that's a 10-year career. Olenek was a lottery pick in – what 2013, which is a draft that a lot of people have compared to this one. Was the Linux 13 or was he was he 11? I think he was in the Giannis draft. Okay. The Giannis draft. If I'm not mistaken, Gobert was in that draft. He was ahead of Gobert. Gobert was, yeah. So um, and if he's Mo Wagner, then I mean that's that's a solid career. Do you think if he's Olenek or Wagner, that's worth a lottery pick? Uh in terms of like the way that you evaluated after the fact, probably in the sense that like, if you were to take look at that draft with Kelly Olenek, he's probably the 14th best player like or better. Um, but in the sense of would it be worth a lottery pick with the expectations of, Hey, we could improve our roster both immediately and have this guy playing a critical role. Probably not. Um, and, and I tend, and, and this is something where I think philosophy differs between people, but I told you this from the first podcast we did together. I, I tend to prioritize upside when I'm in the lottery. I, I want to have my my guys have a chance to be reach stardom, particularly at the, at the top. But if I'm a team drafting 10 through 14, I don't want a guy that I think has to play like a very niche role to to excel. Um, so I, I would say he's probably not worth a lottery pick, but I, I could be wrong and, and it very well may happen, but that's just the way I, I dice up the draft. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, when we return, I want to get Leaf's thoughts on Kalel Ware and Svi Messi, two guys that I'm pretty high on. But before we get into the last segment, let's talk about Prize Picks because Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy and it is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. The easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because it is just you. First, the numbers, instead of battling thousands of players, including pros and sharks, all you have to do is pick two to six players and you're just picking their stat projections and you can watch the winnings roll in. And with basketball season here, you can now pick a combo projection. You can now pick combo projections across football and basketball and the specials league. The specials league was created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, LeBron James and Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combination of three-pointers made and receptions. One of the things I like most about Prize Picks is that it offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return for the second, that player is rebooted and Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So go to prizepicks.com, 
slash locked on. Use the code locked on NBA, L O C K E D O N NBA. And it has to be in lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. Once again, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. All right, last segment. I think we're going to have to make a part two. Are you down for part two? Always. I love me some some draft talk. I, I figure you would be. I mean, you watch more college basketball than anyone else. And uh, there's quite a few centers that, that I feel like, especially in college basketball, that have the potential to be first-round picks. But I want to get your opinion on Khalil Ware. I think... I think sometimes our, our thoughts are pretty similar. I'm a swing for the upside guy. On paper, Khalil Ware is having a good year. There's always going to be concerns about his motor. But he's a guy that I look at. If he puts it all together, I think he could be really good. What are your thoughts on Ware, and have they changed since he switched from Oregon to Indiana? Well, to address the first thing, I was really low on him compared to the consensus coming out of high school last year. Like you could go back to a podcast we did um, pr- about high schoolers coming in last year, and and I, I didn't mention where, and that was like comments were like, "Well, you're missing Kalel Ware, obvious one." So that maybe it's just stylistic. I just didn't buy it as much as some. And then this year, he's obviously been better. Like there's no denying that. But it's it's still like the impact he has on Indiana doesn't wow me to the point where I would want to take a uh, a lottery pick on a guy that already has this established questionable motor to the point where his current coach is like, we're having to teach him to work. <laughs> and that was something Mike Woodson said. He's scoring 15 a game, getting nine rebounds, and defensively he's impacting the game. I agree. Upside-wise, he's got it. Like he's got good touch. He's got the ability to protect the rim. But I just... There, there's something like, you know, you know, when old school coaches say, oh, you, you got to have in your eyes, like you got to be super intense. For some reason, I don't see that with him. Uh, I prefer Eve Missy over Kalel Ware, even though I don't think his, his absolute ceiling is as high. But uh, Ware has undeniably improved his stock from last year. So what range would you take him in? I'd probably say the highest I'd take him is about. 15 so i guess edge of lottery 15 to 25 um he can improve that i i just don't i i just don't like the idea of picking a player that you know has questionable work ethic when his skills uh, they're like the most important thing that's happening in indiana is he's getting the ball in places that are good for him Whereas at Oregon, I think he was out of place in between. Should I shoot this? Should I be the man? Should I pass this ball along? And that team wasn't good. Indiana's not particularly good, but at least there's defined roles. Like Malik Renu is more of the interior scorer who's more skilled on the block. Where can space and be a lob threat? And they play through the two bigs. Uh, But offensively, I feel like that's made him better defensively. And he checked out last year when his role diminished. I I struggle to trust a player that... uh, that has questionable work ethic. Um, and if it's been alluded to at many junctures and, and maybe, I mean, shame on me, maybe it, maybe it's that a player can improve and I have to, you know, a- allow myself to believe in that, but p- picking a lottery pick on a guy that's role will be different. He'll just be a rim protector, maybe a pop guy. It's not like he's a dead eye three point shooter. He's got good touch. Um, it, it, it's a little rich for me and maybe that's something I need to change, but we'll see. Yeah, him and Missy are, if I'm not mistaken, they're born like three weeks apart. Like their their birthdays are very similar. Ware has obviously been on the scene a little bit longer. His name has been in draft discussions a lot longer. And, and Missy is seen as the guy that is the more raw, rawer <laughs> prospect of the two. Why would you go with Missy over Ware? Is it because you think that he... Is it just because you feel like you know what you can get out of him as far as energy and effort? Or do you think that he has some upside to his game that that makes him more intriguing? I think he's a really good rim protector and he's a good lob threat guy already. And I typically believe that big men mature in terms of coordination slower. I think that they have the ability to dominate against inferior competition more than guards but they, they struggle to adapt to higher competition uh, more just because of the maturity is is slower in terms of coordination. 
I think Missy has a chance to be a really good role guy and an anchor. And we're seeing the emphasis on jumbo sized guards that like Luca has made lively. And this is someone we were both high on last year. Derek Lively has been excellent. I think Eve Missy could follow those footsteps or of that, or even Kessler to a degree where he just runs the floor shows impressive hand eye coordination and the ability to space the game vertically. And then defensively he's averaging nearly two blocks a game and he's not playing all that much. I watched him play against Auburn, one of the first games of the year, and had a conversation with my dad that went about as follows. I was like, man, this guy is really athletic. I, I wonder if he's a draftable player. A couple minutes later, he had a dunk, and then he stole the ball and dunked in transition, and it was just on every draft board. Uh, it's the athleticism that pops for me, and then it was with the coordination that pop like made everyone think about it. So I, I think he's got more to develop, and even though the highest ceiling probably belongs to where – because it's more cultivated. I think the you can cultivate more, you can mold more at the ball of clay for Eve Missy. Uh, and I think that his shot blocking ability is probably a little better than Ware's. Yeah, I had Missy as a mid first rounder on my big board 1.0. I'm actually going to release big board 2.0. It'll probably be out by the time this episode airs. If not, it, it will be out this this weekend for sure. He's around the same range that I had him coming into the season. I thought I was a little higher on him than the consensus. I think people are still catching up, but he's still a little raw to me. I think he, some of his plays aren't always visually pleasing. I, I do believe that if they, if you put them all, all the guys that we've talked about so far, you put them all in a group, and if they all maximize their potential, I think where – I think the only guy that you would, to me, that would be higher than Ware would be Bradshaw because I think if Ware puts it together, he could be, like I said about Bradshaw, this rare rim-protecting vertical lob threat and floor spacer that is really valuable that very few teams have. But there's just a lot of chatter about his motor and energy and effort. And what's crazy about it, it's not like this is – intel conversations with with scouts or nba personnel this stuff is like out in the open it's public about where's motor which i i wonder if teams would be scared off from it and then as far as missy me and my brother talked about on a podcast he believes that if missy goes to memphis and Steven Adams isn't there. He's hurt. He could have a Derek Lively type impact as love a rookie. that spot. Love that spot. Memphis tends to pick older players, but I, I would love to see him play with jaw and just get dump offs, dunks, protect the rim and have a defense that can pressure and funnel towards him. I, I really think like he might be the most easy to parallel toward Walker Kessler. We talk about Klingon Kessler. Uh, was projected as like the skilled big at Carolina. He would space mm -hmm. the floor and he, it just wasn't right. Like he's skilled in the sense he's got good footwork. He's got good hand-eye coordination. But then when the, at Auburn, when they let him play drop coverage and then step out and kind of track shooters and block shots at an alarming rate, I think if Missy were to come back for a sophomore year, which uh, because we're talking about him as a one and done, he will not. I think that they would cr create their defense around him, whereas he came in, exceeded expectations, and I, I heard a Baylor assistant talk about that. They're like, we didn't realize he was this good all, this soon. We knew he could be. And now he's forcing our hand because they had Josh Ojan Wua, who is supposed to be their starting center. They had Jonathan Chamwa Chachua, who was a few years ago before he destroyed his knee, the defensive player of the year in the Big 12. So they had the, this hand that they would play no middle defense. They're going to play keeping the ball away from the paint. And then all of a sudden they had a guy who's a shot blocking specimen. And now it would change the, the thought process of like, oh, maybe we should just run people off the line and bring them to him. I think he excels at the NBA because of that. And I think his fluidity is vastly underrated. I think he runs the floor very, very well. And I think he, he slides his hips better than most guys who are new to that role. Yeah, some friends that um, are Baylor alums and they had like a alumni week or something like that. And where, where the alums come back and play some of the guys on the team. And they were the first ones to tell me about him. They were like, he grabbed every rebound. He was going to be a force. And then I've even heard that, like, early in his arrival on campus, they pretty much started preparing, like, you know what? He's not going to be here for a second season. He's he's that good. So I'm I'm happy to see, see him playing well. All right, in the next episode, I mean, we have so many more guys that we feel like, 
or, or at least that we could we could discuss. I mean, we haven't talked about Zach Eady, who is probably going to win. I mean, do you think he's going to win Player of the Year again? Yes, he, I'm pretty sure he's got that all wrapped up, yeah. barring injury, and I'm I'm knocking on wood right here. So, I, I think it's a done deal. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I feel like Edie needs like an entire segment because he might be. I mean, there's a lot of guys that are divisive in this draft class, but he is a guy that has some fans in front offices, and some people believe he's a lottery pick or there is a role for him in the mid first round somewhere. And then there's some people that are like. I would not spend a pick above 40 on, on Zach Eady. So I want to get your opinion on Eady, a Dembona, and then we could talk about Ryan Kalkbrenner, someone that you're high on. But again, this episode has been about the bigs that are in college. We we haven't talked about Alex Saar. I mean, for me personally, I think Alex Saar is like a four or five. I think he'll close games at the five, but because he's so thin, I don't know if he's going to be a five early in his career, but this is... You know, this episode is about the guys in college basketball right now. So stay tuned for part two of this series where we're covering the best five man or center prospects in college basketball. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tulane. Stay tuned for part two and we are out.